Very briefly, I'm Heather. I'll be chairing the session. I'm an evaluation specialist with 3IE. So by way of introduction, Dr. Pandey is the Mohammed Kamal Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, she's a JPAL affiliate where she co-chairs the Political Economy and Government Group. She's also the co-director of EPOD, or the Evidence for Policy Design Initiative, which is out of Harvard. To date, Rohini's work has focused on the role of public policy and in institutions in affecting change, and most recently, and I think through the EPOD initiative, um, she's really been focusing on looking at the design and implementation of policies that respond in a smart way um, to government and market failures. And the paper being presented today actually lies at an interesting intersection about uh, coming up with a good policy idea to overcome a particular failure and the challenges and opportunities in both implementation and monitoring. I should uh, start by saying this is work with many people and we're lucky to have several of them in the room. So uh, Dr. Matthew, one of the co-authors is here and is going to answer every question you have. <laughs> We also have some of the people who were really engaged at the implementation stage, including sort of Sharon, who was there through the process, and Dijo and Devesh, who helped at various points. And of course, I should mention that the local uh, implementing research group we worked through was JPAL South Asia, which has a group of uh, people here. So since I have certainly more slides than number of minutes, which is always a bad rule, I shall um, jump straight into it. So. I guess the starting point of this was something that has been under discussion, at least in India a lot recently, is the distinction between the level at which financing of programs occurs and then implementation occurs. So, you know, recently in India there's been a lot of discussion under the 14th Finance Commission and others of whether this should change, but certainly right now there are a lot of schemes where we see centralized financing, but then decentralized uh, implementation. And historically, when you have sort of cash-based management systems for such programs, the tendency has been to say that you will release funds upfront on the basis of anticipated, not realized expenditures. And so I think the first step that we start from, and as Heather was saying, that's certainly something we've been doing much more at, um, in general as researchers, but I think also specifically at evidence for policy design, is to spend quite a lot of time of taking a fact like this and trying to think about what might be potential problems with it. And so when um, we first started talking to Dr. Matthew, it, it became clear that it seemed like there were two possible problems when you have a system where you're releasing on the basis, uh, uh, basis of expected expenditure. First, you're going to have very often a mismatch between the need for funds and actual receipt because especially for a social transfer program, you can't predict shocks. And so you're precisely going to do it on the basis much more of what you expect to be the flow rather than being able to respond to those shocks. And the second is, the moment you have a system based on anticipated expenditures, you're, going to, you're likely going to put in checks and balances just to make sure that you know, the entire finan all finances aren't taken away on day one. But then these checks and balances themselves can potentially, in a system with weak implementation, become a source of corruption. And over the last uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, a lot of um, the world has moved towards electronic platforms for social um, transfers and other schemes. And the question was whether those can actually offer us some opportunity to resolve these problems. And a key feature that you get from electronic platforms is that you can have a uh, fund flow in real time. And what this implies is that you can actually change the basis from being um, based on anticipated expenditure to being based on realized expenditure. And we really wanted to take this insight and ask, you know, does it matter? So you've seen what the problem is. Here's something that can change the nature of transfers. But you know, does this matter? And I, it became clear to us that to speak to this question, any research on this had to be done on a reasonable scale because um, obviously I can create a lab style situation where this is going to be true. But really the big question is when you have um, potentially implementation issues, when you don't have electronic platforms that work well, um, are those going to be systems in which you're going to still see e-platforms do better? And I think that's where um, we were lucky enough to have the opportunity to look at an evaluation of this platform at scale in uh, Bihar. So what we did and what this paper reports on is a field experiment that evaluates a fund flow reform. Just to give you upfront what it's about. So the status quo, which remains the case still in many situations, many programs across India, is that um, the fund flow is going to be based on anticipated expenditure. So uh, a GP is going to uh, submit an invoice saying, I anticipate doing so many works. This is the wage bill I anticipate. The block will sign off, the district will sign off, and then the state will sign off. And then after that, you're going to have the funds flow into the GP account. In the reform system, um, 
you don't submit an invoice based on anticipated expenditure but you upload the muster roll or the wage bill saying these are the workers who have worked and then on the basis of that the state releases funds directly so you also do you both have an expenditure based system plus the gp is directly uploading it so the block and district don't have to ratify it so our evaluation covered um, uh, was across 12 districts and just given the density of uh, bihar this meant it was over 33 million people and we spent a lot of time trying to look at a s several different outcomes and i hope the aim of the exercise today is to is to put together evidence in lots of different areas to say overall what's the picture we see and i should say that this is currently relevant right now because as was in the newspapers recently there's a recent cabinet note that seeks to see whether a system like this could be made mandatory for enriga in the country so there is interest in seeing whether this can be actually expanded across um, enriga more generally so what i want to do today i want to talk briefly about what this financial reform was and then sort of talk about the two aspects that we think it might have affected on one hand the fund flow um, and related to that something that you know governments care a lot about which is the float of funds or how much dormant funds are sitting in bank accounts and on the second side what happened to spending and employment and finally uh, was there any change in corruption i don't think this is a setting where i need to talk much about what uh, the Enriga program is just to notice that currently around 90% of it is center funded so it's it's certainly a strongly center funded program but all the all the implementation of the of the works is done by the gram panchayat at the village level so in 2013 this program cost roughly 0.5% of india's gdp so it's one of the larger programs in terms of expenditure and it had roughly 50 million uh, beneficiaries so I've talked about these two main concerns, which are one is funds related and the second is uh, significant leakage. So Enriga has certainly been at the forefront of, I think, uh, trying to think about uh, e-governance reforms and just to know things that actually have happened already, which are not true of many other programs. So everywhere you see online data entry, which is publicly available. You can get a complete record of people, days, worked and payments, which is not true for many government programs. And the second is that there has been a push towards now from this year of having uh, wage payments which are uh, completely to bank accounts. So if one wants to think about the big discussion, say, going on about direct benefit transfers, this is arguably um, the place where DBTs really began was um, thinking about um, this year with Enriga payments becoming completely um, going to the bank accounts. Now, in 2010, in Bihar, um, they introduced an electronic platform which was which sought to monitor account balances and this provided the basic electronic basis that we could then use on which to layer the experiment it also importantly created a common state pool of funds so rather than funds sitting separately by district there was now a common state pool of funds that states could draw upon and there were uh, districts had uh, zero balance accounts so they could have accounts into which they could uh, pull their funds so as i said our experiment ran for part of the fiscal year 2012 and 13. So the first tranche of funds between April and September happened throughout Bihar according to the status quo, which meant that in every place you just uh, occurred on the basis of intended expenditures. The reform started with the second tranche. It ran from September 2012 till the end of the, of the fiscal year. It covered 12 districts uh, and in each, the randomization occurred within a district. So in each district, one third of the blocks were randomly selected and in these one third of the blocks all the gps saw the reformed system and the reform system was used to request uh, uh, NREX funds i should say what this this system doesn't speak to is what happens when money goes into bank accounts throughout in both the treatment and the control the money was uh, pushed into the panchayat account and then there were uh, cash payments made out of it so i think it's useful to see this just graphically that's probably the easiest way to see so this is the status quo so as in the status quo you have the panchayat they make a request for funds on the basis of uh, anticipated uh, works that goes to the block that signs off then goes to the district that signs off the district accesses has access to this uh, electronic platform of cpsms puts his request into the state pool so we said there was a common state pool across uh, bihar and then that goes into the panchayat savings account from where it then comes out
And then after this entire process, um, you enter the worker details. So the worker details are entered after the work occurs. In contrast, in the treatment, what happens is that the panchayat um, waits till the work is done. Then they enter the data. They get directly access to the CPSMS, uh, which then pulls from the state pool and gives the uh, money to the panchayat saving account. So what you're really doing is you're changing, in some sense, when the entry occurs and then the layers through which you have to go through in order to come out again. So what do we think the effect would be? So the first is there's just a clear transparency effect. You're now required to enter um, worker details before you get funds. So, so that's a clear transparency effect. And it also, in a setting in Bihar, from my understanding is just before this reform occurred, there was also a push from the state government, government towards more regular audits of panchayats. So in general, there was a sense that this is a system in which audits happen. So now that you know that your worker entry is going up in real time, you may also be worried that this transparency can actually affect you, and so it would potentially have a deterrence effect. Coming to corruption and kind of trying to pass it through a model, the main thing this arguably did was it changed the bargaining power of officials. So in the status quo, you had the block and district officials, and certainly anecdotally, we very often heard that if I went and asked, tried to get my um, request pushed forward, I have to give a cut at every stage. So every stage that I go through is like a toll booth. And uh, in the reform, you've totally cut out the district, so the district can no longer collect any toll. Um, block officers did continue to have some role because the infrastructure facilities were typically at the block level. So you did have to, in order to access the CPSMS, the panchayat officials typically had to go to the block to make the data entry. And so we would expect in some sense this to affect both the level and the distribution of corruption. And then finally, which as I said from expenditure management point is important, is because now uh, you're directly pulling resources from a state pool, you've cut out all the intermediary levels where funds sit. And so this in some sense from a government perspective will reduce what's known as funds float or the number of funds that are simply um, stuck at different levels. So for those of you who know Bihar, this is, our, this is our sample. This is the set of districts we were functioning in. Uh, orange is the control blocks and red is the treatment blocks. And that's the division overall. In terms of the data from which I'll show you the results. So we have the, from the electronic platform of CPSMS, we see the financial transactions. Um, we see the MIS, which gives us the monitoring system for the Ministry of Rural Development. Um, we see the household survey that tells us, so sorry, I should say what this is. After the fiscal year ended, uh, we conducted a survey over three months in uh, over 10,000 households. Um, this was the main survey we used to look at um, how consumption and expenditure had changed as a result of this. Uh, we then from the Enriga database, we can see who the workers supposed to who the supposed workers are, and then we also took a set of assets that we pulled data information on from the website and then sampled them. In terms of politicians and bureaucrats, we use two things. We have an interview from the Mukhya in each uh, village. So we have their own self-reports. But also importantly, now in Bihar, all uh, MG NREG's employees have to make um, affidavit declarations of their assets at the end of the year. And so we had this asset statements also uh, available for, right now, not all the districts, but a reasonably reasonable sample. So just to remind you the timeline of the intervention, so we started preparing the infrastructure in 2012 and realized there are not many computers. And so I think Dr. Matthew's office had to spend a lot of time making sure that we actually got the IT in place. We launched in September 2012, and I think this just emphasizes the importance of doing this kind of evaluation in a kind of real setting. So when you do these kind of field experiments, a common response often is, but you know, how do you know how this will work at scale, or how do you know how this will work um, when problems happen? Well, this was a setting that certainly did not lack problems. We started on September 1st. September 18th, the state pool of funds ran dry. So overall, you could no longer pull funds. Um, the, so the first two months, there was basically the state pool was empty. It didn't mean that there were no works, because remember, especially in the control, you could have already requested funds and gotten funds that you hadn't used. So there could have been works going on. So if anything, this is a period where you may expect the control to perform better because they may have funds sitting, while if you were in a treatment, you would have to pull funds for everything you do. 
And then on December 15th, you, we saw a strike of the Panchayat personnel, which went somewhere into January. And just to say, you know, this year again, I think the strike is very common. It's happening again. I just saw a newspaper article today saying that the PRS has announced July 10th as the self-immolation date. So I hope <laughs> the thing get resolved before that. Um, our intervention went till uh, the end of the year, so till March 31st. And we'll talk about at the end why the intervention was ended then. And then, as I said, our survey went from May till July. So this just shows you the context. So this is just showing you the data on the average daily spending per GP from the CPSMS. So from the CPSMS, we can see spending going on. And so what you see is, in general, as we know, sort of the dry period, which is now, is a period of high activity, which is here. Then, you know, there was a decline, largely because of the strike. And then it went up again. So really, in, if you want to think about the period that we're evaluating in terms of work happening, it's not that large. It's January to March. It's over three or four months that we're going to see activity uh, go on. So I'm going to just go through, uh, since I'm short of time, I'm going to just go through the results um, gra largely graphically. But please feel free to stop me if there's any kind of estimate or something that you're not clear about. So this is the first result, which is um, spending fell. So the blue line is from the CPSMS. It reports the average daily spending in the control. Uh, and the red is in the treatment. So obviously, in the first period, it fell in both cases. This is the period where the state pool had run dry. But as I said, there's still some spending going on because people had funds sitting. And then it goes up. But as you can see, throughout this period, the spending in the treatment is below uh, the control. And when you put these numbers, you basically see that the, essentially, uh, the average treatment GP um, pulled 23 lakh less over the, st over the year. And as a result of that, if you compute the overall, it's 4.1 million. This is from CPSMS. You can do the same calculation using the Enriga NIC data, because that also gives you the data as an independent source. And that gives you a slightly number number of 33 lakhs per GP. So either of these measures that you look at, you see a significant decline in spending. Now, just to be clear, just looking at this, you may not think this is uh, obviously a good thing, right? I mean, Bihar is a setting where one of the big concerns with Enriga, which I think Heather mentioned, is demand rationing. There's low amounts of work, and you may be very concerned that this is a complicated system, and maybe what we are seeing here is opt-out. So what I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to persuade you in the next 10 minutes is that this decline uh, was actually um, a, com you know, a, combination, a, co um, a result not of less work, but of less uh, leakage largely. Related to that, the second part is what we would think of as uh, float. So this, in some sense, you can think of as mechanical to some extent, because if, in, if you're doing less work, or if, you're, if you have less funds, and also you're only pulling funds when, you, uh, when you're spending money, so not doing less work, when you, if you're spending less money, then you're going, to be, you're going to be keeping less money in your accounts. And so what you see here is a, is a very significant reduction, which in some sense just increases over time. Um, and so what we find that over the course of the project, the center credited um, roughly $6.3 million less to the treatment group. Um, and I don't have, I think um, Dr. Matthews will have a number what the total amount of spending is to, from the center to the state, but that's a very significant reduction in the lending, or in the, sorry, in the spending. And then the, finally, the, what we see alongside is, um, I think this is an easier graph to see it in, if I just track now uh, works, um, weeks worked, so this is from a household survey. So in a household survey, these are the 10,000 households. We asked them about every episode of Enriga work going back to uh, July 2012. And what you see is that these lines just crisscross all over, right? So treatment is, is kind of above throughout, but really not significantly. So when you put this into a regression framework, you basically see no change. So you see a very dramatic reduction in the resources, but no change in, um, in uh, the work being done. We also, as you remember, took a large set of Enriga assets that we then tracked in the field. And I'd say in general, this is, I think, across the field, um, case true. You see ghost days and ghost workers in Enriga, but you typically don't see ghost assets. There's somehow there seems to be much less evidence, I think, across studies that you know, there are claimed assets that don't exist. And I think we see that here as well. We typically found, uh, we found uh, essentially 
85% uh, which I think given measurement error I think is a pretty good number of the assets uh, and there's no significant difference between treatment and control so it's like there's a change in the number of assets. So let me just summarize sort of what we found. So we see a drop in the funds parked in the GP so there's, and there's a roughly a 25% drop in GP expenditure. So if we take these two together during the intervention period the treatment GP received roughly 38% funds on average. We see no drop in the number of participation um, according to households from our survey and when we try to trace the assets we don't find a change there either. So given that we are not seeing any change on this front I think a very reasonable question to ask is you know where did this missing money go? Where did we uh, where did you lose this money? So certainly some of it is just less money being parked in the in the accounts right. So we said um, that's the first part. But we also saw a reduction in expenditure and the question is where, where do we see that? And so that brings us to the last part which is really did we see a change in corruption? So in general in Enriga I think there's a large literature now documenting two main types of corruption. So there can be ghost workers where you add p people who didn't do real work and there are ghost days where I take workers and they work for 10 days and I make it 20 days. Now this is a little bit exposed, so I'm not going to push it very hard. But you can imagine different interventions will impact different margins. So there's work that Sandeep, uh, Sukhtankar, Paul Nihaus and Karthik Mulli Dharan have done where they basically in some sense address the last mile issue. So they basically said instead of money going to the panchayat account, what happens if it goes into an individual's bank account? And what they found that did is that that seemed to reduce ghost days, which makes sense is that now in some sense that's where you're going to see the effect. What we did is if you think about that the main transparency effect by having to put up names of workers is that uh, you were worried about an audit where these workers will say I didn't work then because that was the margin you may expect in our intervention to, to see more ghost workers. On the other hand ghost days are as non-verifiable as before or after. So when we test this I won't push it very hard but we certainly f we find that all the decline in MG and regs funds that we can account for is accounted for people we cannot match in the survey. So it, we typically find you know, on our MIS data there are people who say they've worked and then when we go and ask them have you worked they say no they haven't worked. So it seems like in this particular study the main effect it had which is consistent with the idea that if I have to kind of enter names I just spend less time making up those names um, than if I can call funds and then I just have to expose um, add this. So that's about sort of um, the level of corruption. Now the question is sort of who took the hit and here theoretically it's not clear because it's clear that the district officers should have lost out because they didn't have the ability to um, uh, you know, bargain anything. But you could imagine that the power of the GP official went up for instance, right? So it's not obvious that you would expect reductions in say a G GP official because now he's in charge of even more than before. So we did two things, we examined the local politician assets and then we had declared assets from functionaries. So first we don't see any effect on local politicians, we didn't expect to see any so it's kind of reassuring we don't. We find reduced effects uh, from MGN regs in two ways. The first where we should caveat a bit is that um, the, for the district officials remember our intervention was within a district. So this is non-experimental, this is simply taking the 12 sample districts where we worked and comparing assets of district officials to the other um, 20 uh, districts where we didn't uh, enter at all. And you know those could have been different districts with different trends but we do find that in our sample districts the, compared to non-sample districts uh, there's a reduction in assets. And then when we look at the GP employees here we can do, uh, we can exploit the randomization uh, and we see that uh, when we trim it, so there's a bit of noise at the top, so when you remove the top 5% we see a decline in the assets of GPs both um, in the self-declared affidavits and then also in um, their uh, livestock in their own survey. So the final thing that you'll be concerned about and then I'll wrap up after this is uh, what's going to happen um, on other uh, dimensions of public service delivery. And I think the one that in Enriga right now certainly is in the news the most is payment delays. So you might be particularly concerned that there will be a lot of implementation issues. Uh, one for instance is just like you're now asking a lot more to be done on IT side before you release funds. A second is for a bank, the bank has to process a lot more um, 
bills because every work now is submitting an, a, a, a request for funds rather than earlier where you were just submitting one request for the entire quarter. But we find, so what we find is in the first three months, we do see more uh, payment delays. So if you take the first three months, September to December, when, as I said, there wasn't a lot of work going on, Bihar had a lot of payment delays already. It was like over 70 days. It, it adds another 35 to it. But after January, we, see, we don't see any difference. So it seems like the system had teething problems, but they did resolve. The other thing that we found was interesting is that when you have these kind of payment delays and it's hitting the poor who can't actually afford those delays, the system that turns up in the village is um, in some sense the equivalent of payday loans, which is the Pradhan, will give you less than your full amount of money, but it will give you on the day you work. And I think it's important to remember that because I think this is the kind of thing one would often immediately describe as corruption that you know Pradhan gave you half your wage. But it's basically giving you a high interest loan because your wage is taking in this in the treatment of the start over 100 days to turn up. And possibly that worked well enough that when we look at consumption and assets, we don't actually see any discernible change. So as I said, participation didn't change. There's short run delays in payment delay, short run increase in payment delays, but it doesn't seem to translate into a worsened uh, household consumption at the end of the period. So let me conclude. I think, you know, what did we find in this EDF firm? So we found that it reduced um, both the dormant funds in the GP account and it reduced the leakage. I mean, that's the good news. It didn't improve delivery, right? So we didn't suddenly find a lot more people who needed work getting it. And that's important because this is a context in which there was demand rationing. So I think while this is a reform that we we would say should happen, I don't think this is the only thing needed in order to get workers the work they want. The system was discontinued at the end of the fiscal year. And I think one of the things it does, it gives us a re reason to see why in this particular case an evaluation was particularly useful. So in the, in the short run you see fund flow reduce, so you see expenditure reduce, that's what as an administrator you monitor. You hear a lot of complaining from the district officials and the Pradhans who are obviously losing out of corruption. And your fear could be that there's just more demand rationing going on, right? So unless you have the equivalent of the household survey that we did, which actually told you that um, there was no change, so unless you manage to look at the leakage, the rest of the facts are completely consistent with the fact that this is a worse system. And in some sense, you know, our survey had not happened in April. So if you're sitting as an administrator, you're seeing, I know there's a lot of demand rushing in Enriga, now I'm spending even less money, and all the local officials are complaining, it would appear reasonable to say that this is a system that's not working. And I think that's why it was very important that we were able to evaluate its effects. Um, and, you know, but hopefully now in the long run, you know, this reform is being revived. The one thing we'd, I'd emphasize that as it's being revived, it will obviously be important to ensure that we also have monitoring devices in place. So while the cabinet note being circulated is going to move to the system, at least from the newspaper article, I didn't have much sense of how it's going to be monitored in all, because you, you may well see exactly the same things again, right? Um, that less money is being spent, um, but you won't actually know whether people are being helped or hurt by that. So I think that's going to be important if you want to distinguish these reductions in float and corruption from increased rationing or opt-out. And that probably even broadly is even true of many of the DBT reforms being introduced. You can have you know, LPG expenditures go down as you reform subsidies, but some of it could well be coming because of this kind of rationing or opt-out. And so it's important to have monitoring devices there. So let me end there.